Well, hello everybody. Good evening. Um, I guess the first order of business is I'm supposed to instruct everybody to, or ask everybody to please turn off your phones. I just turned mine on because I was hobbling down the stairs. Um, I'm Ken Chadwin uh, from the Department of International Development, and it's my pleasure and honor to um, introduce and host Klaus Alpha tonight um, for the public lecture. Klaus Alpha is a political sociologist at the Hertz School of Governance in Berlin. Uh, he's held chairs at numerous universities in Germany, including the University of Bielefeld, Bremen, and the Humboldt University of Berlin. He's worked as a fellow and visiting professor around the world, universities in the US, Stanford, Princeton, Harvard, Berkeley, and Australian National University. Um, Professor Alpha is an author of countless publications in political sociology, democracy studies, um, some of these include books such as Institutional Design in Post-Communist Societies, Modernity in the State, Contradictions of the Welfare State. Um, I would also say as a personal note uh, that when I was a PhD student um, a while ago, his piece with his colleague, I guess student I just learned, Helmut Wiesenthal, Two Logics of Collective Action, and the debate that that inspired was actually the cornerstone of my entire postgraduate career. Um, and uh, um, so it's an honor to, uh, I feel like I'm meeting my intellectual father here in some ways. So it's, a, it's an honor to share, the, to share the stage with you and um, look forward to your talk tonight. Klaus has asked to, if he could give the address to talk because he's quite tall. And if he looks down at the podium, it's, you know, the pages are too far away. So he's going to speak here. And, uh, that's perfectly fine. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Ken, uh, and uh, uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me uh, to uh, give this lecture, which is basically a uh, still rather preliminary exploration of a field that I think is important and interesting uh, uh, to work on. I do not have uh, uh, data to present. I have a few distinctions and a few uh, observations and a few normative conclusions uh, and that's all and I hope uh, that is not uh, far um, away from what you uh, expect. What is interesting as a real uh, development in public policy studies is uh, a, a book uh, and its influence and its it has changed the field, or two books uh, by Gassanstrin um, uh, and Sala, and the, the term in the title, <coughs> which has become, I think, uh, a buzzword in, in much of the public policy and public administration, uh, is a nudge, too nudge. There is no equivalent in German or um, uh, French uh, or Spanish, to the best of my knowledge, is untranslated in these lang languages. It is basically a uh, English term for an uh, Anglo uh, debate. Uh, and uh, there are institutions, there are huge funds, there are uh, departments in ministries uh, on nudging, that is, on conditioning in a soft paternalist way, I'm paraphrasing the horses, the policy relevant behavior of ordinary people, uh, be they uh, uh, taxpayers, uh, be they uh, parents, be they um, students at educational institutions and, uh, and so on. And the, uh, the uh, uh, this new doctrine of uh, public and I mean just to get an idea of whom I'm talking to maybe you all have uh, uh, studied the book then I do not have to talk about it Sansen and Tala Naj 2009 okay okay they give me I think then I still summarize some of the ideas uh, uh, the, I mean, it is, it is a government or governance practice that is widely within the 
Anglo-Saxon world and in particular in Britain to the best of my knowledge uh, practice. It is based on something that is uh, perhaps more interesting and uh, a theoretical work of psychologists and economists. And that's, uh, this is called behavioral economics. Behavioral economics uh, has one major me message. The message is people are not rational actors. They are uh, uh, driven in their, uh, uh, in their action by all kinds of uh, psychological uh, mechanisms that from closer uh, inspection turn out to be quite irrational. So it is interesting, and I do not have an answer to the question, uh, uh, but uh, I just uh, mentioned the question. It is interesting that the strong critique, both theoretical and empirical, of rational actor models comes exactly at the time when neoliberal doctrines about markets and the, uh, the, all the uh, wholesome uh, things markets do uh, uh, are uh, so dominant. But this is just one of the questions uh, uh, that I want to mention. More questions than answers. What are the questions? Uh, first, does nudging work in which fields? Health, behavior, consumption, energy saving, water saving, and so forth. Does it work? And why does it work? And why does it, doesn't it work it sometimes? Second question, uh, is it legitimate? Um, and that is the uh, uh, philosophical paternalism debate. <coughs> paternalism is a uh, uh, doctrine that says, basically, I know better what is good for you than you know yourself. Right? This is the, the father, the father and his child. It is infantilizing the clients uh, of a, a paternalist policy. But maybe sometimes policy makers do know better than uh, what um, uh, clients, citizens, ordinary people actually do. And uh, this bridge between uh, your knowledge was good for you and my knowledge was good for you is made so nudges. There's a soft push in the right direction. Uh, preventing you from doing something that inflicts damage upon you or others, and uh, <laughs> guiding you in soft ways um, uh, to, to do the right thing. Um, and, uh, and the third question uh, that I want to address briefly on there is, um, not just to the uh, extent they do work, are they enough? Are they uh, 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 good for behavioral controls as they are required for the implementation of public policy? Let me read a few uh, parts of my manuscript, presumably that for a non-native speaker it is easier and can save time that way and then looking forward to, to your comments and questions and, uh, in the, uh, after the um, all policies, to start with a very simple uh, uh, observation, uh, deal with the difference of policy makers and target actors. Uh, or we can introduce the distinction between policy makers and policy takers. All policies are addressed to someone, um, sometimes to everyone in, in a given polity, such as taxes sometimes. A very specific sector. Um, once a policy is made that is passed by a legislature and put in effect, it must be enforced, administered, and implemented. The effectiveness and efficiency of policy implementation, the degree to which its intended effects are actually achieved, depends on the one hand on the adequacy of resources, administrative capacities professional expertise, uh, uh, and so on. 
On the other hand, it depends on the behavioral dispositions and responses of target actors that the policy is meant to address and <coughs> whose compliance and cooperation its success uh, is often uh, contingent. So people must have supportive or corresponding or at least non-obstructive, if that is the right word, uh, uh, disposition. These target actors, which are of interest for us in the following uh, uh, discussion, it can be either formal organizations, that is companies or state agencies, uh, which uh, function according to known rules. They can also be, and that is the more interesting and the more problematic uh, case, they can also be ordinary citizens whose compliance with the policy that is targeted at them is essential yet cannot be taken for granted. To the contrary, target actors may respond to policies in ways that frustrate policy objectives. Whether or not this is the case depends on the behavioral dispositions, the tastes, preferences, styles uh, that uh, govern uh, the responses of policy takers. The question to be addressed here is whether and how policy makers and implementation agents can, as they often try, uh, actually influence or even control the behavioral dispositions of target actors, uh, ordinary uh, uh, target actors. These behavior and the, the, the nudge doctrine says yes, we can, we can do that uh, without the uh, object of our influence of the target population, even taking notice of what we are doing to them. It is, I come to that. These behavioral dispositions can be sort of as the joint outcome of motivational drivers uh, of behavior, uh, such as uh, social and moral norms and interests and so on, uh, and cognitive beliefs uh, that target actors form about the policy and the situation uh, to which it applies and the effects it entails. In case the target actor of a policy holds the right beliefs and is guided by the right motivational orientations, uh, the implementation of a particular policy will be a smooth process of co-production of outcomes. Co-production, uh, all educational institutions are co-productive uh, institutions. Uh, uh, that generate this joint outcome of uh, uh, cooperation. But also a vaccination program, to take one example, is not only adequately uh, uh, endowed with staff and vaccines, but its implementation meets with the enlightened understanding, the enlightened understanding of its clientele about the purposes of the program and the unambiguous desirability of its outcomes. So they know, they have beliefs, and they have motivations, and they go to the uh, place, and everything works smoothly and wonderfully. But that is hardly the standard case. Although the citizenry as a whole, and according to generally accepted constitutional rules, may have authorized and mandated policymakers by giving its electoral support at the input side of the democratic political process, this fact does not by itself generate a fit of agents implementing a policy at the clients to whom the policy is administered. So we can uh, think uh, of two legitimation uh, relations. One is uh, the one that takes place at the input side through uh, representative government and elections and party competitions. Um, uh, and so on, and the other takes place at the opposite side of the political process, and we uh, see that uh, uh, state bureaucracies, executive branch of governments, uh, make very strong efforts to justify particular policies in migration, in uh, taxation, in uh, uh, defense policy, what uh, security policy. Uh, what have you. So the two uh, uh, 
there to uh, separate the streams of managing acceptance and uh, uh, support. In fact, much contemporary policy making seems to be accompanied by a second order policy activity, by a second order policy activities which aim at making implementation more effective and efficient by shaping the beliefs and motivations of policy takers who are recognized as themselves playing a decisive role as ultimate implementation agents. Gathering support for policy can also uh, be uh, designed to uh, preempt resistance uh, through uh, spreading favorable information about its intended purpose and mode of operation inculcating the right attitudes and behavioral patterns and activating conducive moral and social norms or simply assisting people in the making of their day-to-day -day decisions in a more prudent or fact-regarding uh, uh, fashion. Uh, and these, these uh, uh, policy marketing activities uh, are a burgeoning field of activity of all kinds of public agencies. Uh, public relations experts and focus group experiments and uh, the, uh, the testing out of policies is what every ministry uh, uh, does and has large uh, 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 departments and uh, staff uh, for and many of uh, um, these people uh, are trained in the social sciences uh, governance or public administration and so on. Campaigns of what might be called <coughs> social marketing or policy marketing are also deemed to be needed in order to alert policy takers to binding legal prescriptions as well as to sensitize them to the presence of positive and negative incentives that uh, are attached to particular modes of action. Availability of subsidies is part of policy uh, marketing. Uh, the, the people need to be alerted that uh, there are options uh, uh, of tax, the tax deduction and, and so on. What we are interested in is the evolution of policies that are addressed at implementational re relevant actors, which are not formal organizations, but uh, 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 which are ordinary people in their roles as consumers, parents, family, uh, members or potential clients of state-provided services uh, from schools to police, uh, payers of taxes and fees, users of state-provided uh, facilities from highways to public transport to parks, or simply residents of neighborhoods, citizens, uh, cities and other territorial entities and inhabitants of the physical environment. Now, we postulate first distinction. Uh, uh, we postulate uh, that there are three and only three broad methods, broad families of methods of shaping the policy relevant behavioral dispositions of this type of ordinary citizen actors. These are the first, the use of legitimate coercion. Unless you pay your taxes, uh, your income will be confiscated, or you end up in jail, depending on the uh, 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 extent of uh, your uh, violation of norms. People comply because they routinely respect the law, that is uh, 1A, uh, they have formed the habit of being law-abiding citizens, uh, or uh, more rationally, uh, out of fear, uh, for the negative coercive sanctions they expect to apply in case they fail to do so. So I fear that all these negative consequences and therefore I pay my taxes. That is the first family coercion. Uh, um, although uh, only few people have to make that decision, the architecture of decision making and taxation is such uh, that uh, most of us do not even have the choice to uh, uh, escape taxation. Uh, uh, certainly not indirect taxation, direct taxation, maybe nothing. 
first family coercion. Uh, the second family has to do with the use of negative and positive material sanctions, a quasi-market. Uh, people are incentivized, as the term is, to comply with policy objectives and disincentivize, for instance, in uh, uh, emission markets for uh, uh, CO2 uh, emissions. They are disincentivized to deviate. These are arrangements, there are arrangements in place, prices, fees, quasi-market subsidies, taxes, which appeal to the target actor's self-interest, and they are designed to steer their behavior in accordance with policy uh, objectives. And then comes third, the third family, uh, it consists not of coercive means and not of material incentives, but policy tools that are uh, words or other signs stealing the behavior of target populations through talking to them or signaling uh, the facts about the world uh, to them. Uh, and uh, that includes, for instance, traffic lights uh, and uh, bumps in the road. This for some reason very uh, popular, this forces you, without making an argument about it, to drive more slowly, or oh, what's here, have uh, missed it the next time, you will certainly remember to drive slowly, just because of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the nudge that is built into the physical surface of the highway. So, um, uh, uh, they are uh, uh, designed to provide information and shape motivation in ways that bring behavioral outcomes in line with policy objectives, including, of course, the ob objective to serve the best and rightly understood interests of target actors uh, themselves. Uh, there are uh, all three families uh, of policy tools that I have distinguished of <coughs> means, material incentives, words and signals uh, they can apply to uh, four types of dispositions of, of the uh, uh, policy targets. Uh, we can distinguish uh, 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 positive uh, uh, behavioral dispositions, the routine of fasting your seatbelts when uh, starting a car, uh, uh, positive duties are uh, uh, shaped. And negative duties, uh, not drinking before you drive. And that is, uh, uh, and it is, uh, both of these are in your own interest as well as in the interest uh, of others. Everyone else, if you cause an accident, others will be affected. And this second distinction uh, that I uh, introduced here, some behaviors are conducive to the fulfillment of your own interests and nothing else. For instance, uh, entering into a pension plan, right? Not very good for your family members, but it's mostly yourself that benefits from the rational, far-sighted decision to enter, sign up for a pension plan, right? Um, but paying taxes is, of course, something uh, that is uh, in the general or more collective interests and not uh, specific. So you combine the, the positive, negative, and the individual and collective uh, box and have in mind a nice uh, uh, two by two uh, matrix. Um, and uh, the idea uh, in the use of words is um, that is. And that makes it so popular for now six years or so uh, that this debate uh, goes on. Uh, it is the use of signals, nudges, and words uh, is not as costly as maintain, maintaining an enforcement, enforcement apparatus or maintaining positive incentives. It is very cheap and it is not paid for, it, right? So it is uh, the ideal. Uh, tool, or so the, the proponents believe, of uh, policy implementation. Low cost, low pain. 
Uh, and uh, after the uh, Kahneman, Tversky, uh, Sala, and others have done their work on uh, behavioral uh, economics and the, all the irrationalities, uh, the, uh, the magic formula is we use irrationalities of human behavior in order to combat irrationalities of human behavior, thereby correcting for the, uh, the irrationalities uh, in ways that are neither costly nor painful. We do not dominate, we do not coerce, we do not even incentivize. We put people in the right setting and then we, uh, a word that I found in a separate context, responsibilize them. Uh, so you put them in the right context, uh, uh, which suggests the right behavior, and all the rest is their responsibility. I can uh, come back to that. And that goes back to a famous tradition uh, in the study of rational behavior, economic behavior, and otherwise, starting with Herbert Simon, March, Syed, other organization theorists, uh, who uh, uh, coined the phrase of rely, all rely on the concept of bounded rationality uh, uh, with interesting paradoxes. It is irrational to be fully rational because fully rational uh, behavior calculating at, until the 25th position after the comma right, is the gain of uh, the information compared to the cost of gaining this effort is not worth the effort, right? You stop at a certain point to calculate because that takes too much this bounded rationality conversion of, uh, of it. So, uh, and after the uh, deconstruction of rational actor um, assumptions that begin with uh, Herb Simon and the uh, concept of bounded rationality and continued with the rise of behavioral economics, Numerous mechanisms have been discovered which lead us to conclude that coercive legal commands and material incentives are insufficient levers to coordinate human behavior in ways which achieve individual and collective welfare. Additional tools of policy must be employed in order to compensate for um, inherent behavioral irrationalities. And this is uh, also a tradition in, in the social science or policy science of framing science. If you, I mean, framing is a uh, act of interpreting reality without saying something about the reality itself. Glass water half full, half uh, empty is a certain meaning attached to to this. It's enormous behavioral consequences. If you uh, if you advertise a therapy, a new uh, pharmaceutical product, as curing the illness uh, in 90% of the cases. Uh, or if you say it fails in 10% of the cases, it's both descriptively accurate and actually the same. The behavioral consequences are vastly different. The form of being, of course, nudging the patient to take the medicine much more likely than uh, uh, the second medicine. So, uh, behavioral irrationalities in order to overcome behavioral irrationality. This is also the case in view of the cost of monitoring and enforcement caused by the coercive mode of behavioral control, as well as the costs caused by a higher dose of positive sanctions, subsidies, <coughs> and the incentive mode. So, nudges are wonderful uh, from this point of view. Moreover, both of these classical tools, coercion and incentives, have counterproductive crowding out effects, uh, side effects uh, which can limit their utility. So, uh, coercion provokes uh, 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 strategic calculation to avoid sanctions and destroys uh, intrinsic <coughs> motivations. And the same is uh, uh, true, as we know, from, from famous British social scientists such as uh, Richard Titmus on the, on the gift relationship. Uh, if you pay for donating blood, if you get paid for donating blood, uh, 
the motivation are quite different uh, than uh, uh, if you uh, do it for uh, altruistic or charitable uh, reasons. And the quality of blood, I say, has pointed out, uh, is actually different because different people will be attracted by selling blood first. So crowding out uh, 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 intrinsic motivations and voluntarism uh, is uh, something that uh, is associated with the first two families of tools, and this is not necessarily the case. But I have to, to accelerate this. Maybe we come back to it. It's famous. There's a famous uh, case in the literature that people come uh, back to, and uh, maybe I, I tell the story very, uh, briefly. It is a kindergarten in Haifa. Is there no? Everything? Yeah, okay. Okay, the idea is uh, the usual situation. Uh, um, uh, in kindergarten, the staff will go home, the parents come late to pick up their kids, and there's always tension. And uh, as I can say, of course, my quality as a parent, I have a grandfather, there's always a tension with the, um, with the staff. The staff want to leave early, and the uh, parents tend to be negligent. There's, right, in order to overcome that uh, conflict, type two uh, instruments were employed, employed, namely you pay a fine if you are more than 20 minutes late. Right? And they are supposed to pick up their kids by 5.30, and if they come more than 20 minutes late, there's a substantial amount of fine that they have to pay. So this works. This is decided to be create a quasi market. And the consequence is that after a few weeks, everyone comes even later. Because now they can, we can afford to pay them. Uh, we do not have to be guilty. Right? We pay them for staying longer. And, and uh, uh, so the problem is made worse rather than resolved to create a quasi market. And the, the proper method. Uh, so the uh, sense of guilt or of obligation or of uh, appropriate behavior is crowded out by creating a, a market. And in order to crowd it in again, uh, you need uh, a, a, a collective deliberation about what the right thing to do and how we proceed in the future and how we establish self-binding mechanisms that uh, it will govern our style of behavior in the future. So, uh, <coughs> another uh, famous case in the literature is the, the fates of anti smoking uh, policy. Um, this is very often uh, cited. Uh, uh, again, all three uh, policy tools are possible and have been applied. Policymakers can, can try to implement this strategy by legally banning uh, smoking, in particular places, restaurants, subways, in Tokyo, even in open air, uh, around the imperial palace, on, you know, on the pavement, through the smoking rate, because this uh, uh, is disrespectful to the uh, emperor. So you can, you can ban it. Uh, uh, you can, um, uh, decrease the tobacco tax um, and thereby the price of cigarettes that is the type 2 uh, uh, tools uh, you make it more expensive and they can engage in policies aiming at behavioral change and taste alteration by appealing uh, to a uh, redefined self-interest uh, rightly understood you thought you uh, it is uh, harmless to smoke, but now you are informed that it has long-term consequences, and it has uh, uh, long <coughs> it has consequences for others, which explains the success of the debate. It's not just solidarity with your future self; it is solidarity with present others that stops you from smoking, and that is informed uh, by uh, the popular as. Uh, findings of medical research. The three dimensions that I have in mind here, which I think uh, are 
quite uh, rampant and frequently appear in, in, in sociological work. This one goes back to the German uh, sociologist Niklas Luhmann. Is the temporal dimension with long term thinking, right? The rationality of uh, long term thinking. Uh, the rationality of other regarding us, future regarding us, second other regarding us, and the third is fact regarding us, being informed by um, a scientifically proven uh, effects. So these, these are the three instruments uh, you can uh, use, you can ban, you can make it more expensive, and you can um, try to increase the rationality in these three dimensions of judgment formation and behavior formation on the part of citizen. What we see is uh, that um, uh, policymakers started with number three. They tried to <coughs> start campaigns going back to the uh, 60s, uh, uh, anti-smoking campaigns, and then uh, uh, they so that this is not enough, and added the, the, the second, making the cigarettes more expensive, and then bans uh, in, in many places. Um, the bearing of seat belts is a symbol. Uh, first, exhortations, and then uh, at the end, uh, uh, coercive mechanisms are often uh, in. Um, you should be clear about the fact that policies belonging to the third family are not intrinsically more benign in normative terms or more effective in functional terms than policies belonging to the first and the second family. Needless to emphasize, words, signs, and nudges can serve to deceive and manipulate and indoctrinate uh, uh, target uh, uh, populations. I have an example. Of, uh, uh, from my high school days in the, the 50s when we uh, were trained to behave in the case of a nuclear at attack in the following way, we seek to place a place underneath a table <coughs> and put a bag on our head. And the, the, the message was, of course, that uh, nuclear war is not that bad uh, uh, and should not be feared as the afterwards. <coughs> Uh, uh, risk, uh, we can survive it, in particular if we do what we are also trained to do, namely uh, buy uh, 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 foodstuff uh, uh, cans, uh, uh, food uh, in order to survive a uh, stress period. So this was an early form of uh, nudging uh, which had clear Cold War implications uh, at the time. Um, but today you also uh, find the widespread libertarian tendency to blame and shame losers for their health problems. Um, as they can be attributed to addiction, to mistaken nutritional behavior, and to failure to exercise. Uh, if you are overweight, it must be due to one of these reasons. And, uh, 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 or if you fail in the school or in, in the labor market, uh, you have the wrong work attitudes. Uh, if you have uh, uh, the problems of a family breakup and old age poverty, that can often be read as, um, uh, as self-inflicted inflicted, uh, damage. And all these doctrines, Lawrence Mead is an author who does it to the extreme, uh, of course, had the consequence that, uh, uh, I mean, a negative responsabilization <coughs> of victims, right? You are the victim of your own wrongdoing, and we taught you so. Uh, uh, and uh, you have to describe this uh, to yourself. Um, now, a, a more fine grained uh, distinction. Um, which I want to briefly introduce, then I stop. Uh, nudges, uh, in the precise sense, uh, are uh, applications of laws of cognitive psychology, um, and uh, they uh, 
uh, try to shape the desired uh, behavior of patterns without having to persuade through empirical information and normative argument. It is a behavioral autopilot, uh, like in the case of the bumps or in the case of the default uh, arrangement or uh, the presentation of frames of pharmaceuticals and so on. Uh, the automaticity of nudges generates unthinking responses. So, uh, I'll give endless examples from the uh, organization of different goods and supermarkets and uh, how you can uh, incent not incentivize condition uh, health uh, uh, positive behavior by putting the vegetables and the fruit in some place that is can easily be reached and putting other uh, stuff uh, in another place and, uh, and so on. So, the automaticity, the unthinking habit formation, the uh, uh, unthinking responses that are being provoked are the causal mechanism that makes it so attractive. You do not have to talk to people. You simply arrange the, the shelves uh, uh, differently and you get it. You get a, 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 a kind of words that results in behavioral conditioning uh, uh, relying on uh, coercive or incentive uh, material um, uh, levers um, uh, and formal sanctions. And then you have, certainly, in the narrow sense, pure persuasion. <coughs> the change of preference through providing argument and providing uh, information <coughs> supporting that argument. The use of words in the service of what uh, Robert Dahl has called enlightened understanding. Um, uh, concerning the uh, social desirability or undesirability of modes of behavior through the provision of information and the appeal to social and moral norms uh, of responsible, civilized, or simply prudent and well considered or considerate behavior. A rich variety of implementation tools of this kind can be found in fields such as nutritional health, energy saving, road traffic, behavior, non-discriminatory attitudes toward uh, diversity. That is a big thing now. We have to educate people about uh, uh, the value of non-discrimination or the negative value of discrimination concerning ethnic phenotypical age, gender, sexual orientation, and other forms of diversity. Uh, Non-discrimination is a legal standard, but the practice, everyday practice of not discriminating is something that has to be argued for and uh, met and supported <coughs> by uh, moral insiders. Uh, um, environmentally sound consumption and mobility, organ donation is a big thing. Uh, uh, garbage disposal, many others. Uh, behaviors that cannot be coerced, that cannot be incentivized, that can only be argued for through the use of it. And these collectively highly consequential policy errors, or so it seems there is little the state and its policy making and implementation agent can accomplish by using conventional means of uh, political rule. As a consequence, the citizens uh, become the ultimate uh, implementation agents, bringing to bear upon policy implementation uh, participation, as some uh, German also has put it in the 60s, participation as a force of production. Right? Either we all, all of us, decide to do it without being forced uh, because we have been convinced or persuaded by others or by ourselves, or it has not happened at all. Right? These types of policy uh, conditions uh, uh, are to be found in many, many cases. Through so focalized information campaigns and appeals to moral uh, appeals of moral crusades, implementation agents simply try to convince members of a target population of, of what the right thing to do is. Um, uh, the remarkable success that such at monitoring campaigns can have, and here the example is that of the fabulous uh, 
uh, practices of the former mayor of the Colombian capital of Bogota. Uh, I mentioned only the name. You find lots of materials on him and what he has done on the internet. The name is Antanas Mokos, M O C K U S. Uh, I strongly recommend it. Uh, uh, to, to just uh, one example. The elevation of the city of Bogota is 2,600 meters. That means 8 million people. That means a constant, severe water shortage and, and, and that uh, altitude. So <coughs> the, the main thing is to save water. And uh, he organized a, 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 a shaming mechanism that worked the following way. This uh, city is divided into districts, and the water consumption is <coughs> measured for each district, shown on, on television. And there was a contest uh, which uh, incentivized, in a moral, not material sense, uh, the inhabitants of particular waters to be at least as good, if not better, than our neighboring district. Right? And so uh, uh, there was a, a uh, spectacular success in saving water. <coughs> the other more spectacular um, uh, case uh, of his uh, campaigns was a, the case of uh, uh, criminal, criminal law, or prevention of crime, uh, prevention of homicide. Beside, uh, this was one of the most murderous cities, also due to the civil war. Uh, of Latin America, and he uh, started a campaign which simply served as a reminder of norms we all know, we all share, we all take for granted, but still many of us violate. The norm is you shall not kill, right? And so he proceeded to put uh, 5,000 uh, posters, big posters. Uh, on the walls of uh, Bogota with the text, La Vida es Sagrada, Life is Sacred, right? And it did something about the, the, the murder, uh, the homicide rate, uh, quite dramatically, the order of uh, certain percentage points. And the mechanism is following. Whenever such a message is sent, save water or thou shalt not kill, uh, the me two messages are being sent. One is the message, and then the, the meta message, namely the message that this message has been sent to all of us. And our fellow citizens are aware that you have been addressed with this message, and they will watch you uh, in consumption of water or in many other behavioral uh, uh, aspects. So the fellow citizens, the neighbors, uh, uh, are. Uh, becoming uh, enforcers by such such campaigns. Okay, uh, before this gets too long, I, I, uh, let me come to the conclusion, uh, namely the conclusion that the big objection to uh, nudging and to exchanging policies uh, in the interest of your own well-being or our all uh, collective well-being, the main objection is this is paternalistic. And there are uh, serious arguments <coughs> the, uh, from liberals or libertarians who, who say, well, if someone wants to uh, teach us what the right style to, uh, of living is and life, uh, that is uh, a reason for uh, serious suspicion. But an answer to that could also be that um, the third uh, sub-variant of the third family uh, of policy tools, namely the arguing and information without sanctions, uh, can be made into a uh, collective procedure. Uh, and uh, supporters of the idea of deliberative democracy and related innovations have uh, taken that option. It can, it can be uh, uh, conceived of as a collective rather than individual uh, uh, probing uh, 
exploration, deliberation about the right to life and, and not I. All of us, in some sense, want to adhere to. And in that case, paternalism would turn into something that paradoxically, but I think meaningfully, has been called auto-paternalism or self-paternalism. All of us decide jointly on norms that each of us is supposed to follow under the monitoring uh, and uh, softly controlling observation of everyone else. This is probably a possibility in state of communities and neighborhoods and uh, patterns of collaborative consumption that are based on that uh, have worked. But it can also work in social movements and in uh, forms of uh, uh, communities that, for it's also Alcoholics Anonymous, which uh, uh, make norm building and norm enforcement a collective project rather than something that can be resolved at the individual level. Sorry for these, these uh, not very uh, uh, focused but uh, explorative uh, uh, presentation. I hope I can uh, make clear what I find interesting and very exciting about the, the, the field. Uh, thank you very much. Questions. Um, my day job is uh, I'm a recruiter for consulting firms, and I've had a couple of assignments in recently from consulting firms asking me to find behavioral econom economists. I've never heard of the term before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it does seem to be the, the coming thing. Uh, one firm was looking for someone to help their health organization clients uh, put out more persuasive messages about health issues. And the second was uh, for an international development consultancy to help third world governments use these persuasive techniques. But I also wanted to share a story about how I have been affected by the nudge just recently. Um, I fill in a, a self-assessment tax form every year, and every two or three years I get a letter from the Inland Revenue to say I've underpaid my taxes. And it's usually a small amount, £70, £100. Pounds. So I put the letter in a drawer, and maybe when I get the red letter on the second or third occasion, I pull out the letter again and pay it. This year, I got a letter to say I owed about £50, and I paid it within an hour. Why? Because the letter said, Dear Mr. Leslie, do you know that 90% of British taxpayers pay their taxes on time? <laughs> <laughs> so without even referring it to my accountant, I just wrote out the cheque. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's good. That is uh, informing uh, individual taxpayers. In this case, it's a famous, uh, famous practice and allegedly very, uh, uh, very successful, as you uh, seem to confirm. Making okay, everyone else is not observable for you. You do not communicate with other things. Do not find, make agreements. Uh, uh, do not deliberate on whether or not to pay the taxes and how high the taxes should be, that's all. But the government uh, uses the statistics, the process generated data about how many people have paid uh, uh, their taxes uh, in order to put derivative moral pressure on you, right? Derived from these, these data basis and you responded as uh, as they uh, you do not want to be in an immoral minority right? yeah. <laughs> few people want, uh, uh, want to do that uh, and uh, these modern information techniques al allow us to know about the behavior of others 
without ever talking to them. The government doesn't talk to or uh, uh, not talking the measuring, right? the behavioral measuring that then uh, sets the standard for you. Yeah, that is, that is one, one example. I'm going to actually, oh, I was going to hog and have a couple questions, but I'll come in later if you want to, you can go. Yeah, microphone to the. <coughs> I'm an NSC student here in philosophy. Um, I would like to check um, with you because it seems that the biggest problem is not really with um, paternalism per se, but it really seems to be the problem with autonomy. So it seems like the problem is not really with the ends that the government is trying to promote, but the fact that the means is in question. The, the, the question is that it, it seems, I, I'm trying to look at how this is justified, but the problem seems to be really that there is freedom, but there is something that is eroded when the government interferes with the choices in a way that, uh, that interferes with autonomy as, I don't know how, some people say conscience or whatever. Yeah, but um, I really don't know how to address this. And I, I was just wondering what you think about this. Okay, there is a uh, uh, very uh, thoughtful and, and uh, uh, inspiring uh, paper by Julian Legron, teaching here on exactly that question, where he makes the distinction between end paternalism and meat paternalism. And I mean, uh, Silly to, to recapitulate what one of the uh, professors here uh, says, but this distinction is very helpful. And um, in a debate, we came to the conclusion, or I came to the conclusion, that what is really to be objected to is end paternalism. I tell you what is good for you to achieve as a goal in life. Right? But as it comes to means uh, paternalism, uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm this concerned uh, because uh, means paternalism means uh, I try to convince you what good judgment is about questions uh, and how how you improve your capacity for making judgment and overcome your, all your irrational tendencies of short-sightedness or weakness of will and what have you, uh, 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 bias perceptions uh, uh, or falling victim to fall, uh, uh, wrong frames uh, and so on. So there are many uh, hindrances for good judgment. And if we can improve uh, in uh, a time-consuming and potentially painful process, the quality of our capacity or the, uh, our cap improve the capacity to make good judgments, then uh, and if, uh, we can easily agree what a poor judgment is and, I mean, insufficiently complex method to find answers to questions that, and what an adequately complex Messages. We can easily agree on that. And I uh, can tell you, you will be better off if you make a more uh, uh, adequate uh, kind of judgment and improve your quality of making judgment. That is instrumental rather than end. And I have no problems with, uh, with making that um, paternalist move, uh, improve the capacity for making judgment. We'll come back down. No, I'll keep moving back and forth. Thanks. In your opinion, can we have something like an exact science of nudges? Be be because uh, can we the same thing? Uh, exact science of nudges. Be because so, so far now, some nudging works and some nudging does not, and we are not really able to explain why in, in some cases. So, is nudging bound to become just an arty thing where we try something and it's sort of hit and miss? Or can we have like a unified theory of what nudging work with a high degree of predictability, etc.? Okay, I'm, I'm not into the uh, into experiment.
fundamental research that most uh, of these uh, authors of behavioral economics are engaged in. And there are uh, amazing uh, intercultural differences. Uh, so if you play these uh, ultimatum games, uh, for instance, in, uh, in, in North America, or among economic students in North America, uh, which is a, a more extreme case, and compared to the, the outcomes if you played in Nepal, uh, total difference. But behavioral economics, you, you uh, see how often people respond to particular rules, but the culture uh, plays a big role. Although we cannot say how we measure the independent variable, I mean, Traditionalism, altruism, collectivism versus individual. We, we don't know, but from place to place, and perhaps also from time to time, um, uh, results vary. But there is a, uh, a core uh, of uh, irrationalities or deficiencies of judgment. For uh, instance, uh, uh, loss aversion is a, is a psychological mechanism. Uh, before you uh, uh, reap gains from some activity, you see to it that you avoid losses. And that can be quite irrational because you, you forego uh, beautiful investment opportunities. Uh, uh, risk aversion isn't, isn't as a uh, exam. So I, I don't know the answer to, the question, uh, to your question, but I think uh, that there is a uh, reason for skepticism whether this can be generalized. In some places, the same uh, architecture of this decision may work very differently from other places. Uh, Um, I just want to raise the point about means versus ends paternalism. Yes. Um, you say that means paternalism, um, well, I think just really some of the characterization of it. Um, basically, I'm kind of thinking that people, so I'm reading the book at the moment before watching the English. It's just about you know watching English people like the graphic studies and stuff. And one of the things it says is we have unconscious rules, we don't know why we follow them. So people like stand on the wrong side of the escalator past us, but we don't really know why, we can walk around them or whatever. Isn't the problem with what you're saying, means paternalism and nudges by means paternalism, is that we don't know why things bug us, we're being nudged, and we don't know why we're behaving that way. So when it comes to, you know, if it backfires or if it creates a, a bad consequence somewhere else, isn't that a problem with means paternalism or justifying means paternalism? I don't know if I bring that up. What nudges are designed to do is economize on arguments, right? You do not have to think. You do not have to argue with others. You do not have to legitimize the soft force that is being applied. You simply do it or fail to do it. There is, I mean, uh, Sunstein always makes the point uh, that uh, non-compliance is not very costly. It does not require resistance. I mean, uh, uh, organ donation is an example, right? You, you enter a, uh, uh, or the, the alternatives are the default position. Uh, you have to enter into the program, sign a little uh, piece of paper that, that you are willing to uh, donate your organs. Uh, that is one alternative. The, uh, the other alternative is uh, unless you exit from the program and declare that you want to exit, you are in it, right? The second method uh, has a yield uh, of uh, eight times more organs for transportation than the first method, right? So it's risky, okay. Uh, these are, um, in the German case is different, you have to make a decision uh, either way. If you do not make a decision, uh, uh, nothing is going to happen to you. But you will be asked every year by your health fund 
make a decision on this question, yes or no. Right? Uh, and I think uh, that is a good idea to uh, uh, increase or provoke or uh, uh, provide moral incentives for making an informed judgment on this important question. And other questions, etc. This is means uh, paternalism. I want people to have a reasoned conception about what should happen in their organs after the death. Either way, but they should think about this. And we, we uh, insist uh, uh, every year that, that they make a decision without being able to force them to make a decision on, on this. Question. That would be, uh, for me, an example of, of means paternalism. And uh, I think that is nothing wrong with this. Why should not people think once a year about this question? Wrong. It's the economizing arguments bit that I have a problem with. It's reducing the argument, not even having a conversation, that I think the content may be dangerous to backfiring. It's the issue with autonomy as a manifest. Okay, is it demanding too much? Is it paternalistic, uh, paternalistic uh, uh, overpowering if I ask you to make a decision on an important question and argue for it? Uh, it is demanding, but it's not overly demanding. I don't know. I really have the right one. Is the mic on the first row? There's a lovely, uh, there's a lovely metaphor of nudge, because uh, uh, nudges is usually little animals which uh, uh, are devoid of human rationality and the uh, abstraction levels which the philosophy books, wherever they stem from, materialist or ideas. Um, uh, what abstraction levels they have created now? Uh, everybody understands the nudging of an animal. If the cat comes, in case you have a cat, and nudges your leg uh, because it's hungry, you understand the little nudge. And I think there, basically, the uh, gradual development of that term, that Anglo-Saxon term, uh, has to be understood. In, in German, would be better understood as Schubsen. And here you have a beautiful example of Schubsen. Schubsen means push. So there yeah, is it's push. softer than Schubsen. And uh, yeah, but you see, this also here is ironically uh, meant to be understood as a soft push. Uh, it is, of course, uh, a French Lassie, uh, Lagarde, I suppose, who says that 88 people, individuals, fit into a bus and they own more than 50% of the global wealth. So that uh, these kind of statements are readily uh, 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 no longer uh, 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 legitimized by the majority of uh, nudge acceptors. Uh, that means her nudge is definitely going to be detrimental. Like uh, Juncker, uh, the guy who doesn't get now the head uh, control was uh, of our Europe, uh, he also uh, made some statements which the uh, great mass of nudges doesn't uh, accept. Uh, I refer basically in my question uh, to this gentleman who spoke about the individual nudge. So you said uh, if you are very intelligent, a philosopher at the LSE, God knows, you can't prevent with uh, an individual nudging policy the removal of your director at the time when the uh, Libya uh, scandal kind of was nudged along by NATO. So in other words, uh, we have to at all times in the nudging process also see the social formations of the investments decisions which uh, are uh, obviously uh, emanating from a production uh, uh, strategy, uh, from a uh, production 
rationality and reality, which uh, somehow is based on collective production and uh, private uh, uh, appropriation. So uh, that is basically where we have to frame the nudging debate. Uh, in. <laughs> I refer especially to your beautiful point that you retrace the intellectual DNA of your practice now to some uh, thought which uh, Klaus Oppe uh, was doing in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, woman in the orange, check up, down, 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 yeah. We go, boom, boom. Hi. Um, what do you think about over nudging, given um, over nudging, okay, given please. that um, yeah. I think everyone, every man and his dog um, tries to employ this strategy these days, and you get that in um, ad like commercial advertising, government policy, um, I work for a third sector organization, and we do lots of nudging, and do you think that there's a danger that people will um, switch off to some of these, say, uh, even if they're quite carefully targeted, some of these kind of nudging techniques? Okay, that, that is the counterproductivity of uh, uh, crowding out, right? I mean, people are, are well-intentioned uh, and, and want to do something, uh, I mean, if that doesn't cost too much for the uh, Common good and behave uh, in a civilized manner, uh, but if they are constantly admonished to do so, or if they are uh, manipulated in a way that is very counterproductive. I mean, one an example that comes to mind is really extreme. If you uh, travel, uh, as I had uh, the, the occasion to do uh, on the Chicago uh, public transport. You are without interruption. Uh, Remind that you should not put your uh, feet on the seats. Uh, you should not smoke, eat, or drink uh, on the train. You should not uh, lean against the doors. You should not open the windows against uh, the, the, uh, if uh, one passenger objects, and seven other such simple behavioral standards that you would follow yourself, right? without these constant uh, uh, exhortations. Uh, okay, these are counterproductive. I mean, it makes you really uh, uh, want to smash the windows, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, be, because it is, you are treated as a, uh, as a child, or uh, in a way uh, that is inadequate. And uh, nudges are very keen to they do not talk to you, as I, I said, but, but they arrange everything. So I remember for a short while, I mean, if I may just use another example, where uh, you had cars, where you do not have to put your seatbelt on, but you could not um, enter the car without automatically some, some seatbelt uh, coming around you, right, through some complicated mechanism. That, uh, uh, that I found uh, also something uh, overnatural. Uh, uh, I, I wish I could get rid of this thing that uh, simply uh, uh, forced me to behave in a way that I could do myself uh, rather than be, being uh, technically manipulated. By this. So uh, overnatural is a very real uh, opportunity and uh, 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 Perspective. And I mean, if they tell you not once a year, but once every month how your taxes are doing and how everyone else is doing on taxes, you may uh, uh, develop the same uh, uh, obstructionist or anarchic uh, uh, response. <laughs> and and uh, maybe that is the end of it. Right? But the right, right. next option is uh, available. I, I grew up in Chicago. Now, mm -hmm. I, now I understand why I always have my feet on the buses. <laughs> <laughs> Falsely overnudged. <laughs> um, I took up the third sector world and a 
again, a comment to our work, actually, a question. And I come from the world of stroke service, people who have had a stroke. Yeah. And we, over the last few years, the most successful public health campaign has been something called face, arm, speech, tongue, fast. Okay. Which is actually on a very clever television advertising campaign. And that has raised public awareness in a way that nothing else has done in the tried over the years. But it was simple, it was visual, it was clear about what you had to do, and the health service was actually prepared for the impact and I think some sort of the evaluations going on. So in terms of your tools to public policy, I think some of the other issues about if people do change behaviour, is the service of the um, recipients of that change, of that change behaviour prepared for what might happen, the increased demand or a change, because the staff don't react appropriately to the individuals changing, then you might as well not raise the profile or change the attitudes in the first place. Mm -hmm. so, so to use it as a tool of public policy, you actually have to think through, if I may put it, the consequences if it's going to be effective. Yeah. So these four letters the, mean... These four letters, it was, a, it was an advertising campaign to say right. to people, do you actually understand that you might have had a stroke if your face drops, your arm doesn't work, your speech is slurred, and time is brain. So, that is so you need to actually need to dial 999, you need to go to be seen quickly. Okay, this, this is a, a, a means to help people self-diagnose. It's, it's, it's part of the fear campaign, so it's part of your, I think, your right, right. conceptual okay. terms. I think it's people being frightened of loss because people are very frightened of being disabled. Okay. Uh, and But they knew what to do, and it's simple. But you also had to have a situation where they then turned up and reacted in the emergency department of the hospital. The staff reacted appropriately rather than okay. saying, oh, symptoms of mild change, there's nothing wrong with you. And I think often some of the areas that we've got in the third sector, the third sector wants to raise the profile, but this, we haven't worked yesterday, got the situation that the services that we're, we're working with can actually change their attitudes to actually make it easier for people to change their behaviours. Because if people get the experience that they're not responding to, then they just shrug their shoulders and say, no problem. Yeah, but, but this is, isn't that education, information, uh, giving, uh, 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 describing symptoms and uh, what needs to be done about certain symptoms? Uh, isn't that, uh, I mean, what you call uh, paraprofessional or semi-professional practices, you are trained to help in particular situations, I mean, that's it's partly, but it's actually convincing people it's worth making the effort. Yeah, what we okay. had not heard was, uh, of course, the two or three hospitals have abolished their accident uh, emergency department as a result of that campaign because there are now okay. uh, there was a big uh, debate in okay. the newspapers on that. If that is uh, if that is true, uh, 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 then uh, we would see an example of uh, one danger that I mentioned, namely. Uh, I told you so, right? We do not need to, to uh, uh, keep uh, capacities for dealing with such cases. This can all be done by self-help or uh, community help. Uh, and uh, it's very ambivalent uh, in its consequences and fits very nicely in an austerity program uh, of uh, uh, cutting public facilities and it's institutions uh, in favor of educating people for self-help and uh, on this one. If that is the consequence, I'm not sure which side I'm on. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to pop in for one second and I'll hand the microphone over. I want to bring you back to one of the bigger themes you mentioned at the beginning. You said there were three sort of sets of questions that you cared about. One yeah. was, uh, does it work? And the second one was, is it legitimate? And I think most of the discussion that we've been having has been questions around these two things. Or what are the, end, the effects of different interventions and the question about internalism. Mm -hmm. But the third thing you asked was, is it enough? And 
mean, some people would say, and I'll be provocative here, some people would say that the fact that you pay your $50, 50 pound tax quickly, or you wait and you pay a few until you get the third letter, is immaterial when Amazon's not paying their taxes, for example, just to be provocative about it. And some people would, we're, as we were talking about when we walked over here, we're constantly nudged at the LSC to recycle. Everywhere you go, there's a recycling bin. Um, but people would say that, I mean, I recycle all the time, but I do it knowing or thinking that it has absolutely no effect, ultimately, on the fate of the Earth. Um, because there's bigger things at play that affect the fate of the Earth, which some would say we're not doing very much about. And so I'm just wondering whether, I want to bring you back to this bigger question about whether you think this, regardless of whether you think it's effective or legitimate, um, is, it, is it enough? Um, and then we'll okay, hear, uh, you'll be next. Yes. Uh, I meant to address this quite at the end, but of course too late. And I, uh, uh, what I would say uh, on, on this and what has been said by, uh, by authors uh, such as Andrew Dobson um, is the following. Nudges uh, condition your behavior on the spot. So there is a bump on the, on the surface of the road, you drive more slowly. But that makes you, it does not make you a considerate or careful or uh, uh, a driver. You know, you, this is just the one case where you respond spontaneously, uh, spontaneously through this automaticity of response. And the next time, if there is a dangerous situation, you do, do not think for yourself. There is no nudge and you run into trouble. Um, so the temporal generalization and the nudges do not shape durable patterns of behavior. If the uh, candies are all uh, arranged uh, so that they are in easy reach and all the fruit are up there, then I uh, fall back into my uh, inconsiderate uh, behavior. And they do not form a, uh, a principled or rule guided or norm guided uh, type of behavior. Behavior is ad hoc uh, and it is not generalized uh, across cases and across time. Um, and that is exactly what we need, uh, arguably, that we need. Uh, and that's, that, that's why not just even if they work and if they are unequivocally legitimate. They are not enough. We need, in the situation uh, of climate change, environmental uh, 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 problems of huge proportions, and in particular in a situation where uh, uh, ideas of full employment uh, and uh, a steady economic growth become more and more uh, unrealistic. We need a kind of uh, uh, reorientation of our uh, standards of a good life or a, a tolerable good, good life uh, that cannot come through natures. We need to re a reorientation uh, that is much more basic than what natures can do. I have uh, elaborated this in other, other points, but. Uh, uh, in other uh, writings, but uh, I mean, just one, one uh, uh, no one believes that full employment, given the uh, uh, global situation of the labor market, is something uh, that can be <coughs> even irrespective of the consequences of the uh, financial market and debt crisis that can be uh, realized in. Uh, this part, our part of the world. Uh, I mean, 50% or 55% of the growth that takes place takes place at, uh, in India and China alone. Right? And the European contribution to the total growth uh, is shrinking and is based on debt anyway. And, and so so uh, uh, this model of civilization that we uh, have inherited uh, and have practiced uh, is 
soon to become a matter of the past. And the reorientation towards uh, an alternative model um, of income distribution, of time distribution, of uh, 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 conception of use, useful activities or work or whatever you want to call it. This is, uh, I mean, the generation of those who are students today uh, will have to deal with this. And uh, nudges and uh, uh, ad hoc behavioral modifications and the overcoming of isolated uh, pathologies is by far not enough to cope with the problems that everyone sees are coming. Even if you take just one of the uh, uh, problems, energy production and consumption, or uh, and how it relates to security issues and how it relates to uh, climate issues, these are giant questions that depend upon people adopting lifestyles and tastes and norms uh, and behavioral patterns. It depends uh, on it, energy in particular. But it can be, it is not just, it's certainly not the method to do, to accomplish these behavioral changes that we need in order to create some kind of sustainability. I mean, these are very broad and very, very uh, abstract, perhaps. Uh, uh, thoughts, uh, but uh, that is my answer to your question. Maybe uh, no, nudging is by far not sufficient to uh, uh, create the kind of reorientation of uh, behavior that we need in order to cope with uh, uh, these problems that are known to all of us. Um, we have one last question, and then we're going to close. You've been waiting patiently. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to just ask you more about the collective determinism that you touched on. Um, if you walk into our government's department for work and pensions at the moment, there is a huge banner telling you how you can report a benefits cheat. And it's creating a kind of collective mood of suspicion. So I also talked today to a disabled person who used to go and play golf in yes. a wheelchair. She no longer dares go out and play golf because she thinks people will be looking at Play golf, you can go to work, surely you shouldn't be doing that. Just hiding inside my home. I suppose what I wanted to say is that, but this is, we're all spying on each other, it is collective. Um, but some, but there are power dynamics within that collective. Not everybody is equal in this collective. And I just wondered if you could maybe comment on that and also any tips on how we can go challenge it. Okay, I, I mean, notice that this is exactly. Uh, the negative version of what the positive version is. Uh, uh, the tax example the gentleman uh, mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so uh, you are told, uh, and the Scandinavian countries are really extreme uh, in this. I, I learned recently that uh, in Norway there are possibilities to find out what the income of any of the 4.6 inhabitants of that country, million inhabitants of the country is, and how much taxes they paid. Uh, you can find this on the net. Then you can also find who looked you up. <laughs> <laughs> so this is second order information, right? Everyone is transparent to everyone else. And this transparency itself is transparent, right? <laughs> I mean, 1984 is nothing compared. <laughs> everyone is a, uh, uh, everyone is an uh, uh, auxiliary agent of the Internal Revenue Service, right? <laughs> and everyone knows that everyone, is, and therefore, they pay their taxes, right? <laughs> uh, that is uh, frightening. Uh, and uh, uh, it depends on a very high level of trust. My fellow citizens won't do anything wrong with, uh, uh, to me on the face of They will not denounce me. But it, this is, uh, there can be a tipping point. If they're 
if they find out about your uh, cheating on your taxes uh, and denounce you, uh, then denunciation will be uh, a, a common uh, uh, practice and uh, people distrust each other because they have found one case uh, where uh, people violated the rules and uh, will generalize from there, not generalize trustworthy, uh, uh, generalize on untrustworthiness. Uh, uh, and this seems to be the null hypothesis in, in, in your case, uh, what you described, that people are really frightened uh, uh, by uh, the uh, uh, powers of denouncing of other people, right? uh, they, they do not dare to talk. So it can collapse this trust relationship, uh, can very rapidly collapse. I'm, I'm radically opposed to, uh, I mean, the tri triangular relation is the government uses everyone else in order to control you and they give information uh, and, and they uh, okay they can spy on you uh, or the government can um, can uh, uh, inform you about the desirable and laudable uh, behavior of others as it was in the, in the attack most of this is if other people, if I want to be shamed by other people, uh, it is my decision by who I want to be shamed, who my relevant reference group is, and the government should not decide that. I mean, that much of the libertarian I'm, I'm still <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I want to close, take this opportunity to thank the staff from LSC Events for uh, helping run this and um, shuffling the microphones and helping set up. And uh, most of all, I want to thank the audience and Klaus for a stimulating and great talk and the question and answer. Thank you.